Well, good morning again, church. Oh. Good morning, church. It's <laughs> great. Well, I hope you were uh, weak in voice because you put all your energy into praise this morning to our God. I got to tell you, this is one of my this is my favorite Sunday of the year to bring God's word to you. I love preaching the first Sunday or the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Many years ago, I resolved to uh, to make it my habit to preach on the theme of gratitude or Thanksgiving or something related to that on the Sunday before Thanksgiving and. And while Thanksgiving, uh, the Thanksgiving holiday marks our rich American heritage, and by the way, that's something I deeply love. I'm very thankful. Don't let uh, people try to cancel this part of your culture, amen? amen. Don't let them lie to you. Uh, you know, uh, our, our forefathers were not perfect. Their faith was not perfect, but many of the Puritans who came over had... Uh, remarkable faith in God, and they lived through remarkable times. And it's worth going back even and reading those historical accounts for yourself. Anyway, that aside, that's not what drives me to preach about thanksgiving and gratitude on this Sunday. Something even superior to the gift of, of our history drives and inspires me. What drove me to really value gratitude and something we need to come back to regularly and annually is not often enough, was seeing in the Scriptures that gratitude and thanksgiving are among the most valued qualities in a believer's life. We know this because it shows up in places in Scripture that are so interesting and so remarkably significant. For example, Romans chapter 1. When God is giving humanity over to the judgment of their own ways, it says they did not honor God as God, nor give Him what? Thanks. Or in Colossians, throughout the book of Colossians, Paul has a theme of thanksgiving that he threads all the way through as he does in his other books. And in chapter 3, when Paul is highlighting all the essential qualities of the Christian life, love, forgiveness, gentleness, all these great qualities, three times Paul calls us to thankful hearts. And I think the reason is because gratitude is the aroma of grace-filled believers. Well, this morning as we go to Psalm 103, we're going to discover that Psalm 103 does not use the word thanksgiving. Psalm 103 does not use the word gratitude. Yet this psalm does what thanksgiving is. This is a thanksgiving psalm. It ascribes praise to the Lord. It makes much of God. It takes a, a posture of humble rejoicing. It stands in the aroma of God's undeserved goodness and mercy, and it, it breathes it in as deeply as it can, and then it sings. Sings. Thanksgiving sings the song of praise from lungs filled with the oxygen of grace. When you inhale grace, you exhale gratitude. But before we jump into Psalm 103 too far, let's stop and pray. Lord, fill me with your Spirit this morning. That I may be able to articulate and speak and worship through this text the praise that you deserve. And that we may hear, we may receive the living reality of your compassion toward us. Oh Lord, is it not the kindness of God that leads us to repentance? So oh Lord, this morning, convince us, overwhelm us, satisfy us with your unfailing love. And all God's people said. Amen. Psalm 103 has four stanzas, and so we're going to follow those four stanzas this morning. And let me just say that trying to outline Psalm 103 is kind of an um, unnatural 
kind of um, endeavor because it, Psalm 103 is not meant to be a treatise. Psalm 103 is a prayer. Psalm 103 is a song. But we need to dig into it. And so I'm going to try to uh, summarize each stanza with, with some dominant themes that actually overlap as we go throughout the psalm. So you ready to dig in? Here we go. First thing we're going to see this morning is that we must bless the Lord for His mercy to forgive. The theme of verses 1 through 5 is that the mercy of God to forgive replaces sin's judgment with divine favor. Let's read them together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Psalm 103 opens with the psalmist commanding his soul to bless the Lord. That is, he is commanding his inmost being, all that is within him, He's commanding his inmost being, which leads his whole being, to praise God, to rejoice in God. Emotions, mind, body, praise the Lord with rejoicing. What does it mean to bless the Lord? How do we do that? What is that? We know how God blesses us, right? He answers prayer. He provides for us. He does good to us. That's how the Lord blesses us. How can we bless the Lord? Well, the word blessing in Hebrew, barak, literally means to speak well. Sometimes we, we, we could actually translate the word as praise. So God blesses us by speaking good to us. You know what's so cool about this? God, when God speaks, He doesn't just speak. God's speaking is never just sounds. It is action. When God speaks, things happen. Right? He speaks and light comes into being. He speaks and stars are born. He speaks and water is created. He speaks and the, the heavens take their place. When God speaks good to us, He imparts good. He imparts blessing to us. People bless God by speaking well of Him, attributing blessing, attributing good qualities, praise to Him. In other words, God blesses us by bestowing good upon us. We bless God by, by praising the good in Him. Right? Remember James 1.17? Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, and with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God is good through and through. And we get to speak and articulate that. The word Barak also carries with it the sense of bowing. And so praise is an act of humbling ourselves to honor God and to give Him His proper place in our lives. Now notice the psalmist is very particular here. He says he blesses God's name as holy. He blesses God's name as holy, as set apart, recognizing there is no other God like our God. God is in a category all His own. No one like Him. No one to compare to Him. He is the Most High. And the Most High God, the one and only living God, has a disposition of blessing toward us. That's astounding. How many of you have lived a perfect life? This is astounding that the perfect, holy God should have a disposition toward sinful man. And so the psalmist says, forget none of his benefits, soul. Don't forget, soul. Remember how good God has been to you. Recount the innumerable ways he showered you with mercy and blessing. Now let's pause for a second because as we walk through Psalm 103, we must see in it the rich context of the Old Testament. We need to hear this in the right context. We need to hear it in, 
as David would have said it in an, in an Old Testament setting, but we also need to set it in the context of being ultimately fulfilled in Christ. So we have a past context and a future context, and we must put them together. So when David calls us to forget none of his benefits, we hear echoes of Deuteronomy where Moses exhorted the Israelites to not forget the Lord who brought them out of slavery in Egypt. He says, once you come into the promised land, Israelites, you're going to be prone to forget. Life's going to get good. You're going to have lots of blessings and you're going to forget to rely on the Lord. Don't forget to recall the benefits of the Lord. And yet as believers today, we can't possibly hear these words, forget none of His benefits, without first thinking of the cross where the sufferings of Christ secured for us every divine blessing. Now the psalmist begins to list off some benefits that we ought to tell our soul to remember. And the first of these is God's forgiveness. Verse 3, who pardons all your iniquities. Now forgiveness is mentioned first because it, it needs to be first. It is the key that unlocks the door to the treasure house of all of God's blessing. Without forgiveness... We forfeit all other divine benefits. And I want you to notice here in this phrase that God is not half-hearted in His forgiveness. In fact, even to say that God is generous in His forgiveness is still inadequate. God is perfectionistic in His forgiveness. He forgives all your iniquities. How many, church? All. How many is all? All. That's amazing. He forgives all your iniquities. So sufficient is the redeeming blood of Christ that no sin confessed is left unforgiven. The second benefit mentioned here is that He heals all your diseases. Certainly there are many times we have reason to thank God for His healing either naturally or supernaturally. But David has something else in view here, I believe. David is talking about more than simple healing from a common cold or from the flu or the coronavirus. Remember, he is speaking to his soul about the benefits of God's forgiveness. Okay, The phrase, heals all your diseases, notice here, it is sandwiched between two other phrases. The first being, he pardons all your iniquities, and the other being, He redeems your life from the pit. So there's a relationship here between these diseases that He's healing us from, and the forgiveness of our sin, and the redemption of our lives from the pit. Well, the Old Testament often used the language of healing for the soul in terms of God's forgiveness. There's a relationship here. So, for example, Psalm 41, verse 4. Oh, Lord, be gracious to me. Heal my soul. Why? For I have sinned against you. You hear that? Isaiah spoke of those with sin-hardened hearts as having dull ears and dim eyes whose only remedy was spiritual healing. Furthermore, and this is probably more important, Physical diseases, and I want you to think here in terms of plagues, were often a means of divine judgment. In Exodus chapter 15, after the Israelites were delivered from Egypt through the ten plagues, the Lord said, If you give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and you do what is right in His sight, to give ear to His commandments, to keep all His statutes, I will put... None of these diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord your healer. You hear that? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 15. The Lord will remove from you all sickness, and he will put away, not, excuse me, not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt which you've known, but he will lay them all on who hate you. I want you to see here how this 
concept of diseases is functioning as divine judgment in the Old Testament. So David is likely saying, given the context here, and where it's sandwiched, and the Old Testament context, David is likely saying in verse 3 to his soul, he forgives you all your sins, soul, so, and in so doing, he has removed all the judgment of his discipline. He's lifted it. All of it. The frown of God's judgment has been turned to the smile of His favor. There are times when sin re- does result in actual physical illness or disease. We know this from 1 Corinthians 11 and other places. But Jesus went on to clarify in John 9 that not all physical sickness or disease is a direct result of specific sin. So I just need to clarify that this morning. If you're struggling with sickness, you're struggling with disease, it is not necessarily linked to a specific sin in your life. Jesus made that clear. And yet this morning, even though David is likely talking about lifting the disease, lifting the, the weight and the waste of God's judgment on those who sinned, there is still an application here to physical illness that should encourage us. The redemption of Christ is not just for our souls, is it? It's for our bodies as well, our whole being. Remember Matthew 8, verse 17, where uh, um, it says that Jesus took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Well, which one is it talking about there? Is this physical sickness? Or is it the disease and sickness of our sin? Well, it's interesting here because uh, this quote from Isaiah is in the context of Jesus carrying away our sin as the suffering servant. But in the context of Matthew 8, Jesus is healing the crowds. That's the closest context in Matthew. So it's in the context of physical healing. It's taken out of a context of the Old Testament of deliverance from our sin. Here's the point that we can, we can draw. Christ's redemption impacts our whole being. And we know this from the New Testament through and through, right? Right? There is no part of the curse that is not reversed by the cross when God brings His redemption to its fullness. So friends, there is a day coming when we will be with Christ fully healed, body, mind, soul, no sin, no sickness. So forget none of His benefits. He answers prayer today, And He will fully restore us when we see Him face to face. Next, David instructs his soul to bless the Lord for redeeming his life from the pit. The Hebrews use the term pit to refer to destruction. But God not only delivers our soul, notice that here, that's not what David says. He says He redeems it. He redeems it. Redemption was done by a close relative, a kinsman, right? And that kinsman would absorb the cost of redemption himself, personally. Beloved, forget not that our souls have been redeemed from the pit of eternal destruction, saved from the wrath of God by Christ as our kinsman redeemer. And yet it gets better still. It just gets better and better. Verse 4, He crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. See, Jesus not only redeems you out of, the, out of poverty and indebtedness, He crowns you. He crowns you. It's a term of royalty. He gives you dignity by showering you with His loving kindness. His, the term here, Chesed, his covenant faithfulness, his covenant love. It's a term of adoption. He makes you his own, a member of his royal family, along with showering on you all the blessings of being a child of God. And if that is not enough, he satisfies your years with good things. 
Every good thing in life is a gift from God's hand. Not only those things that we consider good, but also the good that God works through our trials and our afflictions. Even in the midst of our sufferings, Jesus crowns us with compassion. Finally, the Lord's mercy to forgive not only forgives your iniquity, not only heals your diseases of judgment, not only redeems your life from the pit or crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, not only satisfies your years with good things, it also renews your youth like the eagle. Eagles rise above. They soar. I love, I love eagles. I saw one yesterday. Oh. Every time I see one, it's just a, thank you, Lord. It's a gift. I just feel like it's, I feel like it's Christmas every time. It never gets old. Yesterday I was sitting in the prayer room. That's where I like to study recently. And, and all of a sudden, eagle swept right down over the parking lot. I was like, thank you, Lord. It's so beautiful. Oh, I want to be like that. I want to soar. I want to have that viewpoint. I want to be able to look from above. I want to have that gracefulness in my life. You know, though our bodies age and our physical strength deteriorates, Paul could say, we do not lose heart though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being what? Renewed day by day. There's strength. There's a renewal of strength. I think the point here is that the blessings of godliness continues to refresh the soul even into old age. I'm not quite 50 yet. My body's deteriorating. Literally. Right? And I have, I have little control over that deterioration process apart from trying to be healthy, which I hope all of us are doing. But there is one thing that I don't have to let fade in my life. There's, there's one thing I don't have to let deteriorate in my life, and that's my enjoyment of God. You can enjoy God until your last breath. You can be full of the mercy of God. You can be satisfied in the riches of God's compassion. Short-sighted as he was, I, I don't think David could have preached the gospel of Jesus Christ any better than he did in these five verses from Psalm 103. Beloved, think for a moment about our wayward how, how wayward our souls have been on the road of sin. In the days of Spurgeon, Thomas Fuller said of the soul, grief grows where joy should. Joy grows where grief should. We love what we should hate. We hate what we should love. We fear where there is no fear. And we fear not him who ought to be feared. All our affections either mistake their object or exceed their due measure. In other words, we set our hearts on any and everything else but God. And we wonder why we're not satisfied. How undeserving we are of such mercy that Christ should exchange our judgment for God's favor through the redemption cost of His own life. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Amen? Let's go to stanza two. Bless the Lord for His infinite compassion. The theme of the second stanza of this psalm is that the anger of the Lord against sin is momentary, but the compassion of the Lord is infinite. Verse 6. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses. He acts, excuse me, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Slow down for a minute. We need to see the heart of God right here in Psalm 103. 
He acts with mercy and justice toward his people when they are oppressed. Just as he did for the Israelites, right, in Egypt. He had pity on them and their cries for help. And he acted. He moved to action to deliver them. He made his ways known to Moses in Exodus 33 when Moses pleaded to see God's glory. He, he put Moses in the cleft of a rock, crowned, he, uh, covered him with his hand and passed by declaring, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children and their grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And it was in this context of displaying and, and pronouncing his compassion and his loving kindness and his truthfulness and his justice that he gave us, he gave Moses his law. He gave the law not only because he is just and righteous in his character, but also because his heart is one of compassion and loving kindness. You see it? The Lord is compassionate today to you. The Lord is compassionate. The Lord is gracious. He always will be gracious. He is slow to anger. Oh, thank you. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful because I'm so slow to stop sinning. He is slow to anger. And yet we provoke His discipline in our lives with our sin, don't we? We do, we do. We do. That's, when we look at this passage here, we see in verse 9, He, he, he will... He will not always strive with us, but there's a reason why he strives. The reason why he contends, that's the word here, contends, why he makes a case against his people. Why? Because we provoke him. And although God will address our sin, even if it takes 40 years, even if it takes two to three generations, he will not hold a grudge forever. Verse 9 says He will not always contend with us. He will not always make a case against us. He does not give His children the judgment they deserve. He gives us compassion beyond what we deserve through His intervening grace. Look at verse 10. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, So great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so God, the Lord, has compassion on those who fear Him. For He Himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. God has not dealt with us according to our sins. What does that mean? <laughs> our sins have been many. His judgments have been few. Or as we sing so often, our sins they are many. His mercy is more. Praise God. Charles Spurgeon commented on this verse, verse 10, he said, we ought to praise the Lord for what He's not done as well as what He has done for us. Even the negative side deserves our adoring gratitude. Up to this moment, at our very worst estate, we have never suffered as we deserved to suffer. Our daily lot has not been apportioned upon the rule of what we earned but on the far different 
measure of undeserved kindness. On the worst day of my suffering, I'm under the mercy of God. On the worst day of my pain, God's mercy restrains it from growing worse. In the worst day of my anxiety or my fear or my discouragement, God's mercy is holding me. He's not given us what we deserve. He's not given us hell. He's not given us eternal punishment for those who are in Christ. Now the irony of verses 10 through 12 is that we have sinned against an infinite God. And though we've sinned against an infinite God, He is infinitely compassionate toward us and has what? Infinitely removed the guilt of our sin. Verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth. How far is that? How far is it? The Hubble telescope takes the human eye 13.4 13.4 billion light years into the heavens and cannot see their end. I think that's about as good a view of infinity as we can get. Isn't it? As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great, so expansive, so infinite is the loving kindness of the Lord toward those who fear Him. But how far is the east from the west? It's greater than the heavens are above the earth. It infinitely grows wider and wider and wider and wider. It's for those who fear Him. Those who fear Him are not those who are scared of Him. Fear of God is the kind of fear that is motivated by love for God. Okay, So fearing God means that we submit our will to His because we are intent on pleasing Him and we are intent on not displeasing Him out of love for Him. It's the love of a child for a good, good, good father. God loves us with a compassion that exceeds the best of fathers. He says in verse 13, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. I think my favorite phrase here actually though is verse 14. He Himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. How considerate. How compassionate. He understands our weakness. His expectations are not unjust. There's so many lessons. If we could only do life twice. There's so many lessons we learn in the first round of parenting. You know, the first 20 years of parenting. And then it's like too late. To do it right. Uh, you know? Oh. I remember at one point as we, our kids were young and we are pouring a lot into them. We, we did have, you know, we, we called our kids up. We called them up. But I can remember at one point realizing like, oh, my expectations are a little bit too high for their age, for their maturity. You know, like sometimes you hit those moments like, uh, I might be expecting a little bit too much. Right? You know? God does not do that with us. He understands our limitations. He understands our weakness. He understands our struggle. He understands that our fight for faith is a fight. I'm so thankful that Jesus came in flesh and blood and can sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15 and therefore, he does, not, he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Through the cross, Jesus made God's wrath momentary. He does not strive with us forever. He does not keep His anger forever. Jesus made God's wrath momentary. 
so that God's infinite compassion could be ours eternally. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Third stanza. Bless the Lord for His eternal loving kindness. The theme of this third stanza is that man's life is mortal, frail, momentary, but God's loving kindness is everlasting. Verse 15, as for man, his days are like grass, it's the flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind is passed over it, it is no more. Its place acknowledges it no longer. But, here's the contrast, but the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. And His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember His precepts to do them. Here David is simply contrasting the brevity of man's life with the everlasting faithfulness of God. Man is mortal, frail, transient. Stop for a moment and think about this. How many billions of people have been forgotten? It doesn't take very many years before your life will be forgotten on this earth. Life is short. Life is, is very short. Should God give you 80 years? The closer you get, the shorter you realize your life is. Right? But the loving kindness of the Lord, listen, has no beginning. And it has no end. Do you realize God does not just do things extemporaneously in the spur of the moment, He's not capricious. There's nothing that God does in time that is not, He is not owned in eternity. From everlasting, the loving kindness you are under today did not begin when you were born. It did not begin when you were saved. That loving kindness expressed to you in your life reaches back into the eternal heart of God and it will reach forward into eternity in all the days that you spend with Him in heaven. The word loving kindness here in verse 17, as earlier in verse 8 and verse 11, is the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed. It can also be translated as steadfast love or best translated as covenant faithfulness. In fact, we need to put all of those translations together. Loving kindness, steadfast love, covenant faithfulness. Right? It's one of the most important words in the Old Testament in terms of the character of God. God's love for His people is a covenant love of faithfulness and loving kindness that He refuses to let go of. He refuses to let go of. In fact, this word represents, this God's chesed includes all of the positive attributes of God toward those He devotes His favor to. That means when He brings you into a covenant relationship, when He brings you into a covenant in Christ, God sets all of the infinite good qualities of His character, and they're all good, on you. And He's relentless on pouring them on you. That's what that means. His mercy, His grace, His kindness, His goodness, His generous benevolence. And David is saying that the, the large-hearted kindness of God toward His children that has always been and always will be will spill over on future generations of those who fear Him. Praise God. And yet it's even better than David could articulate from his point in history. The Apostle Paul picks up this theme in Ephesians chapter 2 and he tells us that when we enter into a new covenant with Christ through His blood, God poured out His mercy and His love on us through Jesus so that in the ages to come, all eternity that is, 
in all eternity, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Like the relentless waves of the ocean over and over and over and better and better and over and over. God will be relentless all through eternity to show you how good, how convincing, how satisfying is his loving kindness toward you in Christ. It's amazing. It's amazing. So bless the Lord, O my soul. And whatever the fire of affliction you may need to walk through in this life, cling to the hope and the promise of God's everlasting kindness. Stanza 4. Bless the Lord for His sovereign rule over all. Verse 19. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens and His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you His angels, mighty in strength who perform His word, obeying the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, you who serve Him, doing His will. Bless the Lord, all you works of His in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David now ends on a climactic note of praise. (laughs) You know, earlier in the psalm, David rejoiced as the beneficiary of God's mercy, compassion, and faithfulness. And now David steps back and sees beyond himself, even beyond the benefits he receives, and he just takes into view God and God alone, God Himself, in all of His sovereign majesty. In all of his greatness. He, his praise turns purely on God alone. One Puritan wrote, His kingdom rules over all. There's none above it. None with it. None like it. None helping it. None hindering it. None without it. Isn't this good news? This is good news in a day when the world is careening out of control. And while every kingdom of man will fall, God's kingdom will endure through them all. And so the psalmist (laughs) reaches as far as he can, exhorting now not only his own soul, but the angels in heaven to join in blessing the Lord. He calls on the Lord's hosts. This could be another reference to angels, or it could be that he's Referring to the sun, moon, and stars to bless the Lord. He calls calls on all of God's works, creation in all its expanse, and the renown of all that God has done to show forth His praise. And then as, as but a living speck of dust in a vast universe in song, He once again tells His sleepy soul to awaken and bless the Lord. This is what you were created for. This is what you were created for. To know and rejoice and be satisfied in the greatness of our God and the tender mercy by which He draws near to us in covenant faithfulness. Will you put off such an offer of mercy? Will you delay to receive such compassion and forgiveness? Will you persist in living in opposition to God, provoking His wrath? Will you not surrender to the loving kindness of God? Romans chapter 1 says, it is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. Why would you come to God? Why would you relent of your independence? Why would you turn from the sin you love if it were not for a God of infinite compassion and mercy and benevolence? A God who rejoices over you by giving you all the good of Himself. Why? See, all that Psalm 103 delights in can be yours in Jesus. This morning I urge you to abandon your sinful independence, to to embrace the forgiveness 
of Jesus by surrendering to His loving authority and His mercy as Savior and Lord. Some of you have been living in a world without God. As though God doesn't exist. Some of you have been living in a wasteland caught up in discouragement and, and strife and trouble and angst. And this morning, God calls you to awaken, to wake up. Maybe where you're sitting this morning to speak to your soul and say, soul, wake up! The Lord's loving kindness is ever great. Forget none of His benefits. Turn back to the forgiveness and the mercy of God who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Amen? Amen. Well, now that I've spent the last 45 minutes or so preaching to you from Psalm 103, can I just tell you, Psalm 103 was never meant to be preached. It was meant to be prayed and sung and declared. It's a, it's a psalm of worship. So let's stand to our feet this morning. And as the worship team comes to help us bless the Lord, we're going we're gonna to lift our voices. And listen, this morning, you may need to speak to your soul as you, as you speak to your soul through this psalm this morning, okay? Only you can determine the authenticity of your intent as you lift your soul to the Lord this morning, okay? Are you ready? Ask your soul if your soul is ready. Is your soul ready? Then let's bless the Lord. Here we go. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He Himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. This place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and who remember His precepts to do them. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you His angels, mighty in strength, who perform His word, obeying the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, you who serve Him, doing His will. Bless the Lord, all you works of His, in all places of dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen.